This is David Wilcox. You're listening to The Soul of Life. I need to have some fun. I need to relax some, but I can't because he's pushing me to work all the time. And you talk to the other guy and he'll say, what? I have to do this because otherwise nothing will get accomplished. So they both see the other as the problem. Today on The Soul of Life, I speak with Jay Early, author of Self Therapy, A Step-by-Step Guide to Inner Wholeness Using IFS. A frequent subject on this show, Internal Family Systems, is a model of spiritual and therapeutic growth that I've practiced for the last 12 years or so that to me is the most effective toolbox that I've ever found to address a wide range of psychological and health-related issues. The crucial part is not just recognizing that we're made up of parts, subpersonalities, but that they are really kind of like little people inside us and that we can actually talk to them and they can talk to us and we can develop relationships with them. Jay and I hone in on the IFS concept of befriending our protectors, not just thinking abstractly about your psychological defenses, but experiencing them in real time with a sort of appreciative inquiry and leadership, the results of which you can experience in your body and mind. Mike Elkin, one of my recent guests on the show, described IFS like hypnosis, except it's far more sophisticated and you can learn to do it on yourself And that's been Jay Early's passion, teaching lay people the steps to learning IFS in everyday life in self-practice. Some protectors really feel hopeless. um, And, you know, like I've had this issue all my life and I've, I've gone to this and that and this, that therapy and nothing's worked. So why do you think you're gonna help me? All of us can relate to having a voice inside of you that tells you when you've made a mistake. For many people, this mental habit can interfere with life and restrict their natural instinct and ability. But have you ever considered that you can actually interact with that part of you? Not just get that critic voice to go away, but get it to work with you and fit into your life in a more helpful way. If you think, oh yeah, I have this type of inner critic and that's all I need to know about it, uh-uh. You, if that, if you, ha- you actually have to go in and access that part experientially, and even if it's an X, Y, Z type of inner critic, you actually have to get to know it because you will find that it's not the same as anybody else's the same type of inner critic. And once you've started noticing that your beliefs, feelings, thoughts, and behaviors are driven by distinct parts of you, it's readily apparent that some of these parts of you don't get along with each other that well. It's pretty common that someone will have two parts that are fighting each other to determine how that person's going to act in certain situations or even how they're going to feel. They're usually two protectors. Their strategies are absolutely opposed to each other. Jay and I dive into specific kinds of inner conflicts that we call polarizations. One part is a procrastinator. It really doesn't want to do certain things. And another part of them is pushing them to do it, like Get, get going, what's the matter with you? And judging them for not doing it. Not only is the person not doing what they need to do, but they're feeling bad about themselves for not doing it. So it's a, it's a double whammy. We discuss how learning to name and separate the inner parts of you that are in conflict with each other, give them both care and compassion, and ask them to let you lead, brings relief and a de-escalation from the extremes of thinking or feeling that catalog pretty much all types of behavioral symptoms and emotional disorders. The main thing that happens in IFS is that the self of the client talks to the part, which is very powerful. Jay has spent decades as an innovator in psychology and personal transformation, but he's also studied social evolution. I ask him how his knowledge of resolving inner polarities could be applied to find solutions to the spiritual, political, an existential crisis in our modern industrial world. Periodically, the whole human culture goes through a transformation. What's needed is for us to go through this transformation into a whole new culture. And I think virtually everything has to change. Welcome to the Soul of Life. I'm Keith Miller. And this is episode eight of season three, Making Peace with Inner Conflicts. Stick with me and I will guarantee you 
I'm Keith Miller, and my podcast, The Soul of Life, is here to help you remember who you really are. I'll bring together people who have gotten off their treadmills. I'll have conversations with athletes, musicians, doctors, scientists, healers, and entrepreneurs to discuss the fascinating edges of our knowledge in neurobiology, psychology, and physics. This is The Soul of Life. Have you ever been in a position where you know that you or your family member really needs emotional support or marriage enrichment, but you find out how expensive it is to get access to high quality out of network professionals? Well, I've created the Soul of Life community just for this. At community.souloflifeshow.com, you can join for free and be part of a network of caring and supportive people having conversations that can bring healing to your soul. It's there that you'll find access to psychoeducational courses to deal with stress, anxiety, and relationship conflict. For example, right now I'm offering a seven-week immersive course for couples called Mindful Marriage that walks people through a mindfulness-based stress reduction curriculum I designed that really gives couples in conflict a map towards stability, trust, and deeper intimacy. Just go to community.souloflifeshow.com, check out the courses, and join for free to be part of the Soul of Life community of learners and soul seekers. Jay Early is a transformational psychologist, psychotherapist, group leader, author, teacher, and theorist. He's known for the clarity of his teaching and writing, his creative methods of demonstrating complex ideas, and his detailed description of therapeutic technique. Not only does he have a PhD in psychology, but he has a PhD in computer science. We'll talk a little bit about one of his inventions uh, and maybe how that relates to his ability to be an entrepreneur in psychology and come up with clear ways to teach about things like IFS. Jay has focused especially on IFS, internal family systems therapy, something that many of my listeners would be familiar with in other episodes. And it has become especially popular since Bessel van der Kolk included a chapter of it in his book, The Body Keeps the Score. And I'll just make a side note to uh, my listeners that I recorded an episode with Bessel about two weeks ago. So refer you to that great episode. And Jay teaches classes in IFS both for the general public and as a practice for self-help and for therapists who want to learn IFS. He's the author of Self-Therapy, a step-by-step guide to inner wholeness using IFS, as well as Self-Therapy Volume 2 and 3, focusing on the inner critic and specific parts of the psyche. Jay, welcome. How are you today? Oh, glad to be here, Keith. I'm good. Thank you. Uh, how is it in California? How's the weather out there? Oh, it's lovely today. I'm excited to speak with you today about things that have you've been working on <coughs> for for a while. I'm curious about your maybe you can share with me a little bit about your how you came on to IFS what you, when you were first introduced to it. What were you doing before that, and what what kind of a difference did this make coming upon this model make for you? Well, my original training was in Gestalt therapy, and and then for quite a few years. I used that, but also kind of branched out and sort of became more eclectic. And then in about 2002, I was introduced to IFS and it just completely turned me on. And I started using it before I actually had any training, which was, um, I, I, I realized in retrospect was, um, was a little tricky because I didn't really know what I was doing. But even if, even when I didn't know what I was doing, I was getting good results. And then, when I actually got the IFS training and and um, and then came back as as an assistant and kept learning more and more, um, it was just magical. I mean, I had so much more. I was so much more effective with my clients. I also used it on myself, of course, and that was also you know really really helpful in terms of my own personal growth. So um, it completely transformed the way I do therapy and. That's pretty much, you know, and for many, for many, many years now, that's pretty much all I do as a therapist. That's all I need to do. I mean, IFS is that good. Mm-hmm. I, I I was uh, chastened a little bit when I spoke with Bessel van der Kolk a couple of weeks ago because I, you know, shared with him my interest in IFS as a as a therapist myself since about two thousand nine, doing doing IFS, and I said I'm an IFS therapist. He said, Why do you Why do you say that? You, you know, you, you're a therapist that uses IFS, he, and he sort of made a big deal over this idea that we, you know, sort of have these religions in our field. 
um, where we, uh-huh. we say we do this and we say we do that. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Have you ever, have you ever reflected on how, how we, how we use the model or whether that gets in the way of human connection sometimes? Well, I mean, certainly there are many people who combine IFS with other methods, um, especially EMDR. I hear a lot. Um, and, you know, that makes sense to me. It just ha- I just haven't felt a need to do that. I yeah. mean, I'm kind of branching out a little bit now in terms of, that's not really into a different method, just in current. Well, actually, all along, I've kind of expanded the IFS model. Um, but it's just fits me so well that that's what I do. And it doesn't really get in the way for my, for my experience, it doesn't get in the way of relating personally to a client. After all, that's crucial to what we do. You know, we're, we're not just, um, experts, we're people and, um, and they need us to be people and to really care about them and relate to them. And that doesn't change. Yeah. Maybe we should. Let people hear uh, an introduction, a brief summary of IFS. How, how do you describe it to people? You're you you're, you're very succinct in your teaching, and, and of course, we could spend you know anybody could spend hours and days studying this, and they can reference many many of the places you've spoken about this, or Dick Schwartz has spoken about it. But uh, how would, how would you introduce it to somebody? What's a layman's summary of IFS? Well, you know, I think the the crucial part of IFS is. It's not just recognizing that we're made up of parts, subpersonalities, um, but that they are really kind of like little people inside us and that we can actually talk to them and they can talk to us and we can develop relationships with them. That to me, well, and there's also the self, which is another crucial part of IFS, which we can get to in a minute. But um to me, that's what makes it so unique and so powerful. Now, I should say that there are other methods of therapy and personal growth that, that use parts in a similar way. So IFS is not completely unique in that, but it's by far the most sophisticated method that uses parts. Right. I mean, you mentioned Gestalt, which you know, in a way right. creates this sort of dialogue with, with, with parts. But exactly. It maybe doesn't have the the systems orientation. Right. Yeah. And there's many others, you know, psychosynthesis and voice dialogue, voice voice dialogue and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So it's not a new concept and it it has been used. People have talked about even colloquially, perhaps in the culture we hear in the movies, people talk about the inner child, you know, it's a little bit of a cliche perhaps to some people. And IFS is, you know, you're talking about uh, personalities, Jay, right? So, um, do do people, you know, does this mean that we have multiple personality disorder? You know, what that's a question I, I hear people ask sometimes. Yeah. Um, well, no. Well, in, in, we all um, have many personalities inside us, and it's not a disorder. It's the human nature. It's the nature of being human. Um, and of course, some people who have multiple personality disorder or DID dissociative identity disorder, as it's now called, um, they also have parts just like the rest of us. Their parts are just more extreme and more split off, Mm -hmm. but it's not, uh, even though it looks pretty, pretty strange the first time you encounter it, it's not fundamentally different from the way we all are. Right. So these voices, if we want to call them that, or parts, will will actually respond to us if we focus on them. There'll, There'll be some sort of dialogue that or connection, some sort of response that happens when we uh, act on faith, I would say, act on the assumption that you can actually do this and you start to engage with these parts. Yeah, and of course, at the very beginning, I guess you have to act on faith, but then pretty quickly you realize, oh, this is this wasn't just faith. They, they, they're real, you know? Yeah. They, they, and, you know, the thing that always strikes me is that you'll sometimes encounter a part for the first time and you know get to know it and give a little appreciation and it will say thank god somebody's finally appreciating me i've been doing this for a long time well that's not just some you know that's an indication to me 
that it's a real little being in there. The yeah. fact that it can say, you know, it's not like I just made it up on the spot. It's got, it's actually got a history that I didn't even know about. You know? <laughs> right. Right. You'll actually experience a, a movement in the body, a physical, emotional, spontaneous uh, response. Yeah. I know uh, so, so working with somatic issues is one of the more powerful ways to see this obvious kind of movement happen. Somebody comes in with a headache and we start to ask the parts to talk to each other or talk to the self of the person. And lo and behold, that pain starts to move. It starts to become a little different. It's often not what it appears. These parts are not often what they appear. Would you, can you say something about that? Yeah, well, that's a fundamental understanding in IFS that comes directly from Dick Schwartz is that, so first, first of all, just to explain it, there's two main types of parts, protectors and exiles. And protectors are often what uh, other systems might call defenses, um, but they see them more as a mechanical thing, whereas protectors are, as we said, little beings that are actually doing a protective role. So protectors will play a role that, you know, they'll shut, shut somebody down or they'll um, get angry or space out or one of a hundred other things. and. The the understanding though is that even though that's that that's a role that they've taken on, often when the person was young, and but it's not it's not ultimately who they really are. It's it's something that's at, and at this at this stage when they come to therapy, it's a problem. Originally, it was actually needed to keep the person sane or alive or safe or whatever it was. Right. whatever they were going through as a child. Um, but ultimately, the part is is not that role. And all, and you see that when, the, when you've done the, a full IFS session or series of sessions and the protector finally is willing to let go of the role, then you, then you get act, actually get to see who it really is. Right, right. I, I was playing tennis the other day with somebody and we, we met for the first time and we were, chatting afterwards about what he does. And he's a civil servant. He works for the FDA. We got chatting about how his life has changed after the election in some ways, a sigh of relief. And of course, after COVID and, uh, and, you know, he, we got talking about that, the political pressure that he felt that he was under and, and, and the, and the former president. And, you know, when I spoke with Dick back in, I think November, it was Jay, he was on the show. We were speaking about Mary Trump's book. Too much and never enough. That was uh, written by one of you know, Trump's nephews, uh, and <clears throat> Fred's daughter, Fred Trump's daughter, who who really kind of killed himself over over time, or um, became an alcoholic and, and and ended up dying at a, at a pre, you know prematurely. And Dick did a did a nice job explaining, and I was just passing this on to this guy, and you know he was actually my, my tennis partner was really riveted. He had never heard for the he had never even thought that you know to to think of somebody who's acting destructively or narcissistically he had never even wondered how that could come from a very human response to fear of worthlessness in the family uh, if everyone in the family well, ends up you know killing themselves or destroying themselves because they end up feeling worthless well i'm going to i'm never going to let that happen to me so these parts well we could you know argue that potentially in, in a family like that like you're you're referring to these parts take on roles. I have to. Ne I can't allow that to happen to me. You know, even right. if I destroy other people or don't, you know, become very yeah. narcissistic. You know, and so he said, "Wow, I, you know, I mean, it doesn't make you want to give the guy a pass." <laughs> but but he 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 was kind of he he thanked me. He said, "I've never, I've just scratched my head and said it just makes all of this. It makes no sense." I said, "It makes. It, I don't. I think it makes a lot of sense. I I, I don't mean I like it." But yeah, you know, I can understand w why these destructive things happen. That can be a relief to people, I think, to realize the chaos inside themselves or parts of them that act chaotically or destructively are not actually crazy. Yeah, I mean, we all need to feel good about ourselves, and if we don't, some parts have to, you know, and it may end up really hurting other people, or maybe not. But yeah. So that's one aspect of IFS. The parts are not what they appear to be. When we get to know them, they they tend to transform. Um, you mentioned the self as well. Can you say more about why is that such a big deal? 
<clears throat> well, um, Dick discovered when he was first working with IFS that that we all have what he ended up calling the self because that's what his patients called it. Um, that um, in addition to the parts, um, we are we have a um, who we fundamentally are is uh, good. It's compassionate. It's caring. It's grounded, and a lot of other things. And um, when we're not taken over by any of these problematic parts, either protectors or exiles, then we are naturally in self. And um, that was a huge, and of course, I think uh, voice dialogue also understands that. It's not completely unique to IFS. Um, and, but it's, it's so powerful because in IFS therapy, the self is actually the healing agent. Uh, I mean, the therapist is needed in, you know, in many cases, but the therapist is not the healer exactly. The right. self is. Right. And the therapist's job is to help get the client into self and recognize when they've slipped out of self and so on and so on. But when the client is actually in self, they dialogue with the parts. Mm -hmm. um, in most cases, um, the therapist can also do that. But usually, if the, if the client's in self, they do the dialoguing with the parts under the guidance of the therapist. Right. And they can, in some sense, the, the self conducts the therapy. Right. Um, and that's very powerful, very empowering for people, and very effective. Hence the name of your book, perhaps a, a double entendre. You know that, that you can you exactly. can do this kind of therapy yourself. You can be you can develop this spiritual practice yourself. But it's also literally because you are tapping into this spiritual core. We could call it that is able to heal aspects of of your of your psyche and of your life, even if they're uh, even if they've been quite damaged. It turns out. Yeah. Let's talk about your book, Self Therapy. I think it's become wildly successful. I've heard you say it's sold at upward of 70,000 copies and it's a self published book. Um, that's amazing, Jay. Congrats. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> of course, I don't get all the credit for it. IFS gets a lot of the credit. IFS is becoming extremely popular these days. Right. And so my book is selling like crazy, but that's not all due to me. Um, but basically, um, I kind of wrote a manual for doing IFS, which didn't exist then and um, doesn't exactly exist in the form that I've done it even now. And uh, even, the book is written ostensibly for the general public. So that's why it's called self-therapy because people, um, some people at least, can really do the work on their own using my book. Some need additional help. So even though it's explicitly for the general public, a lot of therapists also find it very valuable because mm -hmm. it really goes through a step-by-step -step process. And now I should say that on the one hand, the book teaches a step-by-step -step process for doing IFS. On the other hand, the psyche is not linear. Right. And so you, you can't just follow the step-by-step -step process because you need to, you know, that's one of the reasons you need to be a good therapist in order to do this is that the you know, the work goes wherever it goes and you can't sort of right. li linearly try to make it follow the steps because <clears throat> that's not the way uh, yeah. the psyche works. Uh, but nevertheless, when you're learning IFS, to have a step-by-step -step process for the learning is really helpful for most people. I mean, I kind of tell people at the end of my classes, okay, if you really get this now intuitively, you can kind of let go of the steps or not worry about them so much and use your intuition to go where you, it needs to go. Right. But the, the steps are very useful when you're learning. I've heard somebody say, learn these steps, but then forget about it and just try to be present with right. what's happening, what's emerging. Yeah. Um, you do fill in a good, a good deal of uh, maybe some of what, what, what some people might say is some, some of the blank space. You know, in, in, in the model of IFS, some people, uh, you know, in my experience, even Dick Schwartz, the founder, says he doesn't have a real clear, vivid representation of his parts inside of himself. Um, and so some people, you know, if you're the founder of IFS, that's not a problem because he, he has a very strong faith in this for, uh, for many reasons. But other people may not have a very clear or vivid uh, sense of their parts, or they may have what we say, well, I suppose we might say they're, they have managers that are not letting them open up to the possibility. Um, 
and you you give some guidelines. You 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 you. Of course, there's like you said these general labels, protectors, and we could talk about the different kinds of protect protectors, managers, and firefighters, and then right. the pain that they're protecting, which is held in the exiles. Um, and you go into detail. Maybe you can talk about the the way the book is laid out, but you talk about specific protectors, right? What are some of those protectors that you you invite people to to look for? Actually, it's not a good idea when you're learning IFS to to focus on specific types of parts because you can start to think that the type of part tells you what it is, mm. and that's not true. Typing parts can be useful, but ultimately each part is unique. And um, if you think, oh, yeah, I have this type of inner critic and that's all I need to know about it, uh-uh. Yeah. You if that if you have you actually have to go in and access that part experientially, and even if it's a X Y Z type of inner critic, you actually have to get to know it because you will find that it's not the same as anybody else's right. same type of inner critic. Right. And furthermore, it isn't even just a matter of getting to know the part; it's a matter of developing a relationship with the part, and that is the self of the client developing a relationship with the part. Uh, and that's really crucial. Um, many people think that IFS isn't a relational form of therapy because there's not a lot of focus on the, the therapist-client relationship, although there is some. But it's very relational, in the, but the relationship is between the self and the part. Right, right. Yeah, and then the expectation is that that, that builds, that the, the client is not going to become dependent on the therapist. And have to do right, years and right. years necessarily of therapy. Um, can you draw a line, Jay, from your training? I want to ask you about your your prior life as a computer scientist, and maybe you can speak in some way to try to describe what what you're known for in computer science as the early parser invention in, in a computer algorithm. Uh, yeah. My son is actually studying, we're quite interested in linguistics. He's in high school, and he's already subscribed to the you know, Journal of American Linguistics Society. And you know, he would, I think, understand a little more in depth your, your Wikipedia page on this invention. But can you draw a line from <laughs> <laughs> your, your days as a computer scientist to perhaps the parsing that you're doing as you teach IFS? Well, it's only an indirect link. Um, I didn't bring any of my computer science stuff into psychology, except it's the same. I have it's the same mind of mine, so I have that kind of cl clear um, mind where I can, you know, focus and lay out, you know, in detail, you know, a, a method like like I do in in self therapy. So I use that capacity that I have, um, that you know, that I was also using in computer science to. I mean, one of the things that, you know, I have weaknesses and strengths as a writer. One of my greatest strengths is clarity. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not as good at um, writing stuff that's really engaging and, you know, Pros. Um, super personal and people get right and all that. But, I'm, but clarity is my great strength. And mm -hmm. so, um, yeah. And, and what was the, the early parts or what is it? Could people still refer to, to it in, in their... In, in current work, it seems like it would not be worth my try to explain it. We could get too far afield. It, well, it it works with any um, grammar, and either for a computer language or a natural language like English, or mm -hmm. and 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 if if to the extent that it's used at all, it's actually I think more used for natural language. Interesting. Parsing. Interesting. That's something my son is is very interested in. He's he's constantly coming in and talking about uh, the different. I, I can't even, from the minute he starts talking about it, I have no idea what it means. <laughs> um, you realize how systematic linguistics is. I had no idea, but also how related it is also to the, to the field of psychology. And, and you, you spoke about your book, Self Therapy. You've talked about your developing it, uh, IFS a little more, perhaps. I would say maybe putting it on steroids in some way, talking about capacities. You also developed something called the pattern system. And you, you you work with capacity development groups. Can you speak about those a little bit? Sure. 
So I started out developing the pattern system many years ago, even before I discovered IFS. And then it turned out that it fit perfectly into IFS. So patterns are basically types of parts, you know, an inner critic, um, an angry part, you know, a people pleasing part, and on and on and on. And so I developed a whole system for understanding patterns and capacities. Um, and the um, for people who are um, highly left brain creative like I am, they really get turned on by the pattern system. But most most people don't. <laughs> it's too it's too oriented to the system, mm-hmm. and um, not enough toward the actual patterns and capacities. And so, um, I about a year year and a half ago. I started developing what you what I'm now sort of thinking of as the pattern system 2.0, which focuses well in two ways. It focuses more on capacities than patterns, mm-hmm. and that turns people on much more. They're much more interested in how can I develop these capacities to help my life better. I mean, patterns are still there, um, but the other thing is that I've that I've put much less emphasis on the system. And more on individual capacities and how people can understand them, how they can figure out what parts block them, and then do IFS on the parts that block them, and then also various ways that they can cultivate and develop capacities. Um, so capacities, I should I see I'm getting too abstract here. So capacities are things like self-esteem, um, strength agency, um, and many, many more. Um, so they're, they're, the, they're the, the kind of things that we would like to have to live our lives in, in a way that will really work. Mm-hmm. And there are many, many of them. So um, let me ask you, Jay. Let me, let me, let's sure. just use an example. Like if I come into your office and say, Jay, I'm struggling with, you say, what's going on? What's the, what's the issue? What, what would you like help with? And I say, I am, I'm, you know, I'm finding myself feeling defeated uh, struggling, struggling with motivation, having a hard mm-hmm. time getting started. Um, what, 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 how would you apply capacity work, and and where would you? Well, one of the one of the things I would probably do, just as as we got going, is I might say, well, if you were able to overcome that um, difficulty in getting started and all that, um, what would that look like? <laughs> And they would probably end up pointing to various capacities that, or at least one or two capacities that they would like to have that they don't have. You're prompting me to imagine, well, what would, what would I like to, how would I like to feel? Well, I'd like to feel accomplished like my, like my friend Joe or something like that. So, um, so what, so I might say, what would it take for you to be accomplished. Mm-hmm. Like right now you're feeling um, like you're not sure where to go or you're, you're unmotivated, not feeling, not feeling motivated. So, so the ultimate goal might be to be accomplished, but what would it take and what capacities would you like to have that would get you there? Yeah. 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 And so that's just a little, that's just one little piece of the way it comes into the way mm-hmm. I do IFS. The, that I call those goal capacities. So somebody sets down, you know, where, where they'd like to where mm-hmm. they'd like to end up. You get me thinking about and, the target, the, you know, the, the 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 feeling I'd rather have instead of what I actually have right. or the state. Now that doesn't mean you can just go there. You know, <laughs> right, uh, right. <laughs> you still right. have to do the work. Please take the time now to subscribe to the Soul of Life wherever you're listening. Give it a thumbs up or write a positive review. But if but it's good to have that idea of where you're headed or where you like to head. Now, where they where they actually may end up might be a little different than they think. But right. nevertheless, like so, the way this can come in, one of the ways that this can come into the IFS process is that some protectors really feel hopeless, um, and you know, like I've had this issue all my life, and I've I've gone to this and that and this that therapy, and nothing's worked. 
So why do you think you're going to help me? Exactly. And I'm not going to let you go forward unless I really believe that you can help. Yeah. And, and that's a very important that so the idea that protectors need hope is already in IFS. Dick Dick Schwartz actually talks about being a hope merchant, but the hope that he offers and the hope that he offers protectors is that if they allow the therapy to go forward and the healing to happen, they'll be able to let go of their roles, which is great. That's one aspect of hope. Mm-hmm. But with with the I with the goal capacities in mind, you can also say, not only can you let go of your role. But you can have, you know, these capacities. Mm-hmm. This is the way that your life can look different. So that's mm-hmm. another way of providing protectors with hope. So you might actually have to tell me personally, like you may have to say, Keith, I think you can do this. I think you have the capacity to focus on what you want to get done tomorrow, or you can have that conversation with this person that you're afraid to have this with. I think you could try it. Why don't you try it? Try it a day and come back and let's talk about it. Something like yeah. that. And that's a looks a little bit more like coaching. Yeah. And uh and of course there are many coaches that use IFS too. Um but and it's interesting that you bring it up that way because all of these capacities are aspects of self. Mm-hmm. So this for for folks who are listening who know IFS and you're wondering what what are you bringing this other thing in for? You know, we already have self. Well, it's not a separate thing. What what I'm doing with the capacities work is I'm breaking down self into a lot of you know self is not is is this enormously powerful um, basic who we are for everyone, but it's not a monolithic thing. I mean, Dick Shorts knows that he he talks about the eight C's of self, different like compassion and curiosity and so on. Um, but there are many more aspects of self than even the eight C's, which Dick has already acknowledged. So these are expressions of self. These are manifestations. There are spe- different expressions of self. And whenever you're in self, you, 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 you don't necessarily have access to all of those at any given time. Mm-hmm. Like at a given time, you might be a full of compassion, but not have so much strength or clarity. Mm. Um, and mm. so... It's useful to kind of unpack self into these different capacities so that you actually have more specific ways of working with it. That makes a lot of sense. It seems very, it's, it's been very helpful for me to have some of your, what I, what I consider menu choices, you know, some, some options, some ways of thinking about, like you said, some left brain ways, some categorical ways of thinking, but ultimately, you know, could it be this? Could it be that? It's more than just an intellectual guide. That was the mistake I made with the pattern system, and it was too intellectual. This this gets right. Um, you can you can incorporate a capacity orientation into doing a regular IFS session, mm-hmm. and sometimes in ways where you don't even um, talk about capacities. Like for example, if I'm doing. Um, Sometimes, by the way, in, in IFS, sometimes we do t- talk directly to a client's parts. And parts have capacities. So if I'm talking to a part, you know, and I can sense that it has a capacity, I might say, gee, you're, a, you're really a, a loving little guy, aren't you? You know, and so I'm helping to, um, first of all, that helps him to trust me. It also helps him to understand that he's more than his role, like we talked about. Mm -hmm. And so it's a way of, and also may help him to actually grow and become more of the loving part that he can be, Mm -hmm. um, even though he's stuck in, you know, in a role that's not very loving at that time. Right, right. And in talking to parts, you're referring to direct access, what IFS calls direct access, what some people who don't know if IFS would maybe consider sort of role-playing. Uh, would you agree? Right. It's sort of like you, you, you start speaking, not just to me, Keith, the whole person, you're speaking to the, the part of me that's complaining about be, you know, not having enough money or something. Right. You're talking to that yeah. complaining part. And that's not the main thing that happens in IFS, but in certain circumstances, it's really crucial. 
uh, for the therapist to be able to talk directly to a part. Right. Yeah. Right. But the main thing that happens in IFS is that the self of the client talks to the part under the guidance of the therapist, mm-hmm. which is very powerful. But direct access is sometimes very powerful too in a different way. It's it's, it's sometimes necessary because we don't have the, the person may not have self enough or a sense enough to be able to separate and hold that <clears throat> in their imagination or in their mind, that separation. Right. Perhaps. Um, can we talk about polarizations, Jay? Because that's something you, I think you've contributed quite a bit to that, that part of the work when we're, we're using IFS. Why is it so important to identify and work with polarities? Well, um, it's pretty common that um, that someone will have two parts that are fighting each other to determine how that person's going to act in certain situations or even how they're going to feel. And um, they're, they're usually two protectors, and they each have... Um, I mean, their goals for the person might actually be somewhat similar or they could could be different, but their strategies are absolutely opposed to each other. Like classic polarization is, um, well, let's, let's say a person um, is, um, one part is a procrastinator. It really doesn't want to do certain things. And another part of them is pushing them to do it. Like, Get get going. What's the matter with you? And judging them for not doing it, and so you've got this polarization between, you know, the, let's say the taskmaster, which is one type of inner critic, and the procrastinator, because they're absolutely opposed. Um, and so that can be um, <clears throat> that can kind of shut shut everything down. You know, mm-hmm. not only is the person not doing what they need to do. But they're feeling bad about themselves for not doing right. it. So right. it's a it's a double whammy, um, right. and that's right. very that's very common. That there are many many different polarizations, and and the people who have more serious trauma underneath will have even more polarizations. Right. Um, and so that's a crucial part of what's needed in IFS. Sometimes you sometimes you can't just work with like you would think. Oh, they're procrastinating. Let's work with the procrastinator. And sometimes that will work, but sometimes you have to actually work with this, with this polarization between the procrastinator and the right. taskmaster. Meaning, for example, if you start to interview me as the procrastinator, and you start to say, "Well, how are you procrastinating? What are you doing to make him procrastinate?" and I start to focus on it more, or maybe start to feel it actually take over as we're speaking, then immediately I might start mm-hmm. to hear. Another voice, which is very angry, or my my body may start to become very anxious. I may start to panic, just because we've now gotten closer to the procrastinator. We've gotten it out in the open. I'm speaking about it, and it's getting bigger. Well, now the 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 well, not only that, but let me jump in yeah. because what the procrastinator might say is, "Well, listen, there's this other guy over here." who wants me to work 24 seven, that would be horrible. I'm not going to do that. Yes. You know, I need to have some fun. I need to relax some, right. but I can't because he's pushing me to work all the time. Right. And you talk to the other guy and he'll say, what? I have to do this because otherwise nothing will get accomplished. Right. So they both see the other as Just the problem. <laughs> pointing at, at each other. And then the person feels, yeah. feels this tension and this exactly horrible feeling. Yeah. And it escalates, right? Unless you start to, it escalates. And also, just being able to name it de-escalates it, doesn't it? It brings a sense of relief to the system that, oh my goodness, these parts are actually trying to help. This is something we'll often say to people, you know, tr- to, to try to acknowledge the positive intent behind those parts. Right. Exactly. And and then what? So there's a couple choices. One, you could just do the regular IFS where you heal the exiles that are underneath one of the or other of those parts. But sometimes the parts actually need to talk to each other. Mm. And, um, and if and the, generally the client in self needs to get to know each of the parts first, so the part begin to trust the self, but then you can actually ha- have them talk to each other and under the guidance of the self, you know, with help from the therapist. Um, and gradually over time, 
first of all, the parts begin to realize that the other wasn't, isn't, isn't this crazy, horrible thing mm. that it's actually trying to get something good for the client. Um, even if the, they don't agree on what it should be. Right. But eventually they, uh, more that the more, and, and you can facilitate the dialogue between the two polarized parts so that they gradually learn to cooperate instead of fighting each other. Right. Um, yeah. And yeah, they're, they're on the same team. Yeah. Um, but often don't get that message because of the pain that they're, they're so afraid of the pain or so afraid of the other, the other part taking over and causing some problem. Exactly. Um, well, it's a very hopeful message. And, and, and even though our conversation may be rather technical for some people, you know, hearing about this for the first time, there is, I think often we, we invite people to just give it a try and see. It's, I think it's hard sometimes to imagine this. What we're, what exactly we're talking about, but it's it's <laughs> much easier to experience it with a person who has some training to facilitate you. And I, I I can speak from experience. I'm sure you can as well. That that's really the best way to do it, rather than um study up you know endlessly on this subject. Just really just give it a try. <laughs> yes, this is this this work is very experiential. You can start doing it from your head, but then pretty quickly. You actually have to go inside yeah. and 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 relate to the parts and, and right. Right. yeah. You know. Yeah, it's amazing. Um speaking of polarities, I want to ask you as we wind up here about your sense of what we're going through as a culture, as a larger culture and, and how how you're bringing some of your teaching into the larger world and trying to help facilitate um wholeness and healing. Uh, between you know groups of people in our culture with these polarities, one part you know, just thinks anything the other segment of society does is just <laughs> just horrible and immoral and demonic and and we hear that on both sides. How are you? What how? What's your experience of of what's happening in our culture? Well, um, I've actually studied social evolution and um, at a pretty large <laughs> level. And but I think it's been useful. Like one of the things I see is that periodically the whole human culture goes through a transformation from one um, culture stage of evolution to another. And I think what's going on right now is that I mean, we've been in what's often called the modern industrial era for roughly four or five hundred years. And it's been wonderful in many ways. And, but now it's gotten to the point where it's created problems that it doesn't know how to solve. Yeah. And, and we're in a crisis, not just, not just climate change, which is the most visible aspect and the most dangerous aspect of the crisis, but a lot of other things. Violence. Yeah. And so I think what's needed is for us to go through this transformation into a whole new culture. And I think virtually everything has to change. Mm. And um, so, and I think when you get into this kind of a crisis, that leads to these polarizations. Like there's, um, you know, everybody, sort of everybody intuits if they don't actually understand intellectually that we're in a crisis but they attribute it to different things like some people attribute it to um you know the government being too you know being too powerful or mm -hmm. you know or not um, powerful well, enough right one or the other. so um so when we're in, we're in your crisis kind of people go to more extremes mm. um and I mean, in one sense, we need something extreme. We need to actually transform our entire culture and our social structures, um, but not in an extreme. I mean, it has to be a natural flow, and uh, you know, um, although you know, there could be a lot of dislocation in the in the process too, and and some some people will have a rough time with that, and some people and organizations in power will lose their power so it's not it's in so it's it's a you know it's a thing that a lot of people will fight but i and um 
anyway, I think that's, um, from my study of social evolution, I think that's what's going on. And it's, um, it's, um, it's hopeful if you look at what's possible, but it's also pretty scary because um, who knows whether we'll actually get there before um, serious um, major problems happen. Right. Right. No, it's, it's a big question and, and, and maybe it does bring us some comfort to step back and look at large, larger trends. I'm a, I'm a fan of uh, Yuval Noah Harari's uh, work. He's written a couple of books. He's a historian, but he's written a book called Sapiens, talking about the evol- what he believes is the evolution of sapiens, homo sapiens, mm-hmm. to something he thinks we're on the cusp of because of bioengineering. You know, somebody says, "Well, I, you know, we want to cure cancer, so we're going to we're going to allow all these, uh, you know, human editing projects to go forward on the genome." Well, once once somebody extends their life because of cancer, and then I mean, go down the list of all the other um, illnesses that people say morally, well, of course we have to we have to do it because of that. Well, but you know, I, I would just like to live uh, five more years. How about that? <laughs> so we begin editing cosmetically, and then eventually. Uh, you know, re- reach some other form where the, the human genome is no longer sapiens. It's, he thinks we're on the cusp of that, of, of being another type of, uh, animal altogether because of the engineering that will probably cross a threshold at some point. Yeah. And then there's artificial intelligence and, yep. you know, there's, there's all kinds of stuff that, um, but, that to me, the problem is I think that's more of an extension of the modern industrial era. I right. don't think he's actually looking at the kind of transformation right. we actually need. How do you help facilitate that, that, Jay? How how what can a person do if they're interested in in being part of something that's uh, transformative and healing? Well, the first step for all of us is to transform our own um, worldview. You know, to actually see the limitation, you know, and I'm not all there either. I'm, you know, we all grew up in the modern industrial era or, well, some people are actually in an older worldview, but to actually see the worldview we hold and to see what's possible in terms of what some people are calling a regenerative, you know, era or worldview that we need to move into. Mm -hmm. Um, So I would say that's the first step is to, is for each of us um, you know, obviously I'm biased because I'm a, I'm a therapist. So I, I look inside first, but, um, this is not therapy. This is, this is actually looking to see what is the worldview you hold and how much, how much of it is in line with the modern industrial era, which is actually causing the problems. So can we transform our worldview into, um, one that's more holistic, more relational, um, more guided by the feminine um, and a lot of other things that right. we probably don't have time to get into. Right. But. right. Well, in, in distribution of privilege as well. I mean, that's one thing that's, oh, that's yeah. such an important piece that we we even have privilege that we can speak about this, that we're not worried about, um, you know, our bank accounts, that we can have this conversation, sort of a high level conversation. We don't. <laughs> so it's in some exactly. ways, right? It's a bit of an ivory yes. tower, in some ways. Um, how do we get out of that? tower of privilege and, and immerse ourselves in whatever uh, injustice or suffering actually needs you know, direct access, literally. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's a big part of it too. Well, it's wonderful to speak with you, Jay, early. Um, uh, delighted, all, as always, to get a chance to talk with you. Is there any, any projects or anything you'd like to promote? Where can people find your your work and find you? Uh, my website is personalgrowthprograms.com with hyphens between the words. Um, and um, the latest thing I'm doing that I'm excited about is a um, capacity development program that inclu- incorporates IFS. It's central, you know, so IFS is central to it, but it brings in all um, the capacity stuff that I have alluded to briefly here today. So that's uh, and and I t- periodically am doing webinars on uh, the capacity stuff because there's a lot to it. So somebody could just um, sign up for the next webinar and see what's going on. Great. I encourage people to give it a try. It's highly experiential and it's something I've done with you many years ago and learned from you by being part of uh, your one of your groups and 
speak very highly of it. Thanks, Jay Early. Thanks for being with me today. Thanks for having me, Keith. I enjoyed it. Hey, I've started a community for Soul of Life fans interested in talking about episodes or getting more information about some of my teaching on IFS, mindfulness, and relationship growth. Head on over to community.souloflifeshow to get access to this group of really cool people just like you who care about the show and want to talk about episodes or, or hear more, or get access to courses and, and support each other through life. That's what this is all about. Please leave an iTunes rating for the show and subscribe now wherever you listen to get more soul in your life. I like it and it's not harsh to my eardrop. All right, I will go.